Hello world of the internet, this is Dr. Rob. I am continuing my series on how God specifically and on purpose designed species to change over time. I came to a one of my favorite areas, just a little park near my home. And I actually came here last year and filmed on a log just over there, but that log is now underwater. Why? Because beavers have dammed up a little teeny stream and created a giant marsh. This did not exist. This was not like this. Even a few months ago, things have changed. Yes, things change. In fact, species change. Organisms change. The environment changes. Nothing is constant in our world. And that leads me into a further discussion on how God designed things to change. If you haven't seen my first part in this series, I'd encourage you to go back and watch that. There'll be a link in the show notes below. But just in brief, I talked about a big phrase called pluripotent baronomes. If you want to know what that means, you really need to go watch that first episode. But basically, it just means that God put in a lot of genetic diversity into his created kinds. And over time, that genetic diversity worked itself out to produce change. It is a brilliant design. It has allowed species to persist on this earth even as the earth has changed and even as mutations have developed and even as new threats have arisen. They still persist because of that brilliant engineering that God put into that initial creation. I talked about several different ways that, that diversity arises. First through the uh, appearance of um, homozygous uh, recessive traits like a white coat color in an otherwise dark colored population. So over time, brand new traits can appear that never existed before. Also, the um, activity of things called jumping genes or retrotransposons, they can jump around in the genome and turn genes on and turn genes off. So some of that information God programmed into that initial creation could have been in latent form. Another latent form of information is the ordering of genetic variants along a chromosome. Well, recombination can bring in new combinations of genes that never existed before, and those new combinations can lead to new, what are called phenotypes. That's the look or the behavior of an organism. Changes built into the system. Okay. I want to take that discussion and uh, ramp it up and get away from the individual and talk about a population level. Because now we're talking about the origin of species, which is very important in the creation evolution debate. So if we're talking about populations, first thing to consider is what would happen to the land-based vertebrates that were on Noah's Ark after they left the Ark and started spreading out across the world? Well, consider bears. Two bears, they make four bears, they make eight bears, whatever the reproduction rate in bears is. And as they reproduce, they start spreading out. Those little groups of bears are going to get separated from one another. And each little group is only going to have a selection of the original diversity within those two bears. What this is is called a founder effect. The offspring can only carry the genes that were in the founders. So if you take a a genetically rich population and divide it up and spread it out on the earth, you're going to get founder effects. And so if one of those subpopulations has a lot of tall genes or a lot of dark genes or a lot of furry genes, they might look different than another population. Their behavior could change, their reproductive timing could change, their smell could change. A lot of things can change and we would get what we call now species. Even if they're reproductively compatible, they might not ever meet themselves because one branch might have gone south of a mountain chain, one got, might have gone north of a mountain chain. They're reproductively, they can't mix, but we call them different species. In my next episode, I'm going to talk a lot about species definitions, how evolutionists have used it, how creationists can use it, and I'm actually going to throw down a trump card where I think we can explain this very easily, but you have to wait for that. By the way, this video series is paralleling an article series that I'm publishing on creation.com right now, How Species Change. If you want to read that, I would highly encourage it. There'll be a link in the show notes or just go to creation.com, type in Species Designed Change, maybe Carter, if you want to narrow the search results. And those articles will pop right up. If you get speciation from animals that have separated in geography, that's called allopatric speciation. It's just another word for us to understand. Allopatric means species that develop in different places. That's easier to explain than sympatric speciation, where species develop in the same place. But imagine a population of cichlid fish in one of the rift lakes in Africa. So Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Malawi, those, those giant rift lakes. Each one of those lakes has a lot of species of cichlids. 
And when you look at the different lakes, you see similar but different species. And genetically, when you look on it, like, oh, the fish in Lake Victoria that have a red spot on the tail, they're not genetically similar to the ones in Lake Tanganyika with a red spot on the tail. That species in two different lakes rose independently. How? Well, imagine that those cichlids have some diversity in their coloration. You get spots, you get stripes, you can get solid colors. And they have some diversity in the choice genes that the females clue on. So maybe one female likes red spots on a tail, another female likes black spots on a tail. Well, you can instantly get partitioning of those species in the same lake, living on the same time on top of each other. Very interesting. And yet, hobbyists have figured out that these species can hybridize like crazy. They might not in the wild, but they certainly do in a fish tank. They're the same created kind, obviously, that had been partitioned into little teeny groups, sympatrically, not allopatrically. By the way, this is a warm Georgia day. I had to wait for the sun to set below that hill there before I could start speaking, which means that I'm gonna get eaten alive by mosquitoes probably, and I'm sweating like crazy because the humidity just went way up to about 100%. But that is the nature of living in the South. Place I love, but sure is hot here. Whew. So the next question we get to ask is, how fast do these changes happen? Well, let me throw this at you. I believe the rate of change has slowed down dramatically because those initial created kinds would have been robust, they would have been strong, they would have had a, a huge amount of genetic diversity in them. And as the genetic diversity got partitioned into individual little subpopulations that we now call species, they're gonna have less information than the original. They're gonna have less ability to adapt. Their adaptation, their change should be slower than it was initially especially when you consider the years right after the flood. So someone like Charles Darwin comes along in the 1800s and he's looking at farm animals and he's trying to look at examples of things changing over time and he doesn't see much change and he says, aha, the rate of change is very slow. It must have taken millions of years. Nonsense, Mr. Darwin. You were looking at a very small window of time and did not understand what God had initially created. So the loss of genetic diversity over time, the loss of robustness, and what I call genetic pigeonholing. As a species finds a new environment, they get finer and finer tuned to exist in that environment over time. They lose the ability to adjust to another environment. So an Arctic fox cannot live in the deserts of Arizona, but the red foxes in Arizona can't live in the Arctic. The original fox kind diversified to live in both places. How much speciation do we need? Not much, I'll get to that in a second. The next obvious question is how much change is allowed? My basic understanding is that whatever God created can be rearranged, duplicated, mutated, broken, amplified, turned on, turned off, as long as you don't require the, the creation of a brand new genetic system or a complex biochemical pathway, you can modify what's already there. There are some creationists who teach that something like whales may have been on Noah's Ark with legs. I have big problems with that because the transition from a land animal to a whale is not simple. Whales don't have a connection between their blowhole on top of their head and their throat. A whale can't choke on his food. Birds, reptiles, mammals, land vertebrates, all, the, all of them have a nasal passage that connects to their throat. Their breathing and eating system is combined. Whales aren't like that. So did that initial whale-like thing on the ark with legs have a disconnected system? It would have been unique amongst all the other terrestrial vertebrates. But also, baby whales can nurse underwater. That ability would be totally wasted on a land animal. Uh, plus, the baleen whales have those strange plates that they, they use to, on the top to filter out krill in the water. Well, that would be completely useless in a land animal. Also, the ability to echolocate underwater, completely useless in a land animal. So I really struggle to believe that something like a whale was on the ark, even in a latent incipient form. But there's more to that story because it depends upon where you draw the line between the flood and the post-flood eras. Now, if you're like me, in the past anyway, I used to say, oh, I was right there at the KT, at the KPG, at the, uh, the break between where you find dinosaurs and where you find modern animals after that. And the evolutionary story, that's 65 million years ago where the big meteor hit the Yucatan Peninsula and all that. But I said, oh, that's a nice break between dinosaur era and modern. 
I no longer believe that because of the work of other creationists, specifically in geology, have, who have moved me off that position. If the flood, post-flood boundary is higher than the KT, there were no whales on the ark because there are whales buried in those sediments. They existed at the flood. Second, if whales were on the ark and the KT is a flood, post-flood boundary, you don't have a lot of time for the I don't want to call it evolution, development, what do you want to call it? The loss of legs and the, the drive on to, into the water from a land animal. You don't have a lot of time because I fully suspect that the rate of sedimentation slowed down after the flood was over. Therefore, a lot of that initial sedimentation was more quick. And when you look in the, excuse me, it's hot out here, but when you look at the fossil record, whales, I'm going to round off here, about halfway between today and the time when dinosaurs existed in the evolutionary model. So you don't have a lot of time for these radical changes to happen. We're not talking about lions and, and tigers and kitty cats changing or developing from a cat-like creature. We're not talking about dogs and wolves from a wolf-like creature. We're talking about radical changes that require some pretty big changes and maybe even develop on brand new molecular pathways. That to me is disallowed in the system of God creating. Now it's still possible, we still have to work out the math and, the, and the, uh, the implications here, and the question has been raised, so it's worth talking about. I just don't believe it. All right, the last thing we have to talk about is the evolutionist claim that the creationist must therefore believe in hyper-evolution. Now I'm going to, in my next episode, talk about the claim that, oh, you believe in change over time, therefore you believe in evolution. Now, that's not true, and it only could be true if you adopt the lamest possible definition of evolution that, that could exist. That's next time. For this one, let's talk about hyper-evolution. If we believe that all the cats came from two cat-like things, is that hyper-evolution? No. Why? Because if you look at the number of species within each created kind, now, where do you draw the kind line? I'm comfortable drawing it about the family level. And if you draw, draw it about the family level, of course, the Bible doesn't talk about kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. That's not a biblical classification scheme. But if you draw that line about the family level, you realize there's only a, a few species within each created kind. We're not talking about beetles and worms and butterflies and, and fish, things that didn't have to be on the ark, but land vertebrates. There are only a few species within each created kind. Therefore, you don't need much change to account for them. Most uh, vertebrate families have between five and 20 different species. Modern living species, that is. There's some extinct species in each one. You might have to double that. Some vertebrates have, or land vertebrates have, up to maybe 400 or more species, but those are, but those tend to be the small species, mice and things like that. Things with very high population sizes, very fast reproduction rates, things that have had more generations for the speciation process to happen, and things that are geographically disconnected. Because house mice in... Norway can't breed with house mice in China. It doesn't happen. But birds can fly between those places, so long-distance dispersal species tend to have fewer species per kind than species that can't disperse far and that have high population sizes. But so what? I mean, mice, a couple of hundred species in a few thousand years. Imagine that those two mice come off the ark and they start reproducing like crazy and you have allopatric speciation and then one species splits again, and one species splits again, and one species splits again. You can actually have exponential increase in species numbers in per kind. You don't need a linear rate of species formation. Even though that can happen, you could still explain it in the amount of time that we have, 4,500 years. But if you had an exponential rate, it's even easier. I want to leave you with a Bible verse. This is Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. My friends, God is the master engineer. He is an amazing designer. He created life to survive and persist despite everything that the natural, cursed, fallen world can throw at it. The fact that species are still alive today is only testament to the creative genius of God himself. In fact, not only was life designed, not only was it robustly designed, it was over-designed on purpose by a beneficent, loving creator who wanted life 
to survive, even though he knew the fall was coming after creation. You know, I would be nowhere without my supporters, and I want to give a giant shout out to the people who are allowing biblical genetics to exist. Over on Patreon.com, you can become a Patreon supporter very easily. Just look in the show notes or go to Patreon.com and search for biblical genetics. My top tier supporters, Dave H., Adam B., M. Matsky, and Rob S. My middle tier supporters, Mark K., Mike from Australia, Daniel P., James R., and Jeff V. D. My bottom level, but not forgotten, level supporters, Jonathan P., Ted H., and my brand new Patreon supporter, Paul P. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are helping me tremendously, not only encouraging me, but giving me the ability to pay for the equipment, the hosting, and all the other little expenses that go into trying to run a YouTube program. Over on buymeacoffee.com, buy me a coffee is more like a tip jar, you know, $3, $6, $9. Here, Carter, thank you much, have a digital coffee. I've had several anonymous donors this month. Again, I think there were three, but Stephanie S and Stephanie F, George S, Cowboy Bob, Stephen F, Brian M, and Logan K, even though you're more than a month back, your, your gift was generous enough. I just wanted to give you one more shout out and thank you before you fall off the one month window, which is my typical thank you for uh, Buy Me A Coffee uh, contributors. Hey y'all, I want to just close by encouraging you that this created world is beautiful just like our God is beautiful. Our created world is complex, just like our God is complex. It's worth studying, it's worth digging into, it's worth exploring, specifically because in exploring we get to learn about God Himself.